to the Dutch area where art is done for Protestants and for trade. Protestant painters at this time are forced to either quit their trade as artists or begin selling their arts as a ware or a commodity that could be um, sold and traded as a good. This new system is the beginning of the modern art market. So do you see how isolated Flanders and the Dutch are from the other Protestant countries? This creates a really interesting phenomenon in art. We see these small areas um, that become more specialized in their particular skill set. We can see these artists from the Dutch world as little masters. In other words, the area seems to have regional specialties. This is a vanitas. Um, you can see that the artist uses uh, items that would be items that were recognized as worldly items. And what I mean by that is that typically the person who was commissioning the still life would have been a person who uh, had been well-traveled. Travel in the... Um, 17th century was something that only people who were of upper middle class or of the aristocracy were able to do. Travel is very expensive and it takes a long time to travel um, during this time because they don't have cars, they only have or airplanes or anything, they only have uh, stagecoaches. And so if you were going to Europe, uh, well, that's a bad example because you're talking about the Dutch area, um, but if you were going to, um, well, if you were going to Austria from Italy, it would take months to get there through stagecoach. Um, and so the items that you see here, the figs and the dates and the expensive nuts would have been something that was either very expensive to have imported um, into the Dutch world, or it would have been something that they would have gathered from trade and travel. Um, the teapot that sits behind the pretzels and the bowl is a teapot that would have been acquired through travel. Um, it has a Middle Eastern root because of its long spout um, and European teapots tend to be rounder and squattier. So we know that uh, a sense of wealth is portrayed here through either trade or through travel. And also you can see symbols of the Dutch world, like the tulips in the vase. Um, you can also see, I don't know if you've ever been to the Dutch world, but um, pretzels are something that are very popular in the Bavarian part of Germany, as well as in the Dutch world. Um, and so like I've been to Germany, uh, to the Bavarian world and there are pretzels everywhere. Like just like we have McDonald's, they have pretzel stands. So at any rate, um, you see a sense of wealth being portrayed here. Um, and you see a sense of uh, death being portrayed here. And what I mean by that is that you've got things that are able to perish and spoil and eventually die. Um, the flowers, um, you can see that they've already started to head south towards dying in that they're not um, all pictured straight up and down. Um, like the tulip is curved. Uh, there are several of those um, flowers that sort of look like carnations um, that sit in the front. They're not carnations. They're another type of flower. But the point is, is they, they're wilting. They're starting to die. Some of them have even lost so much um, water and uh, hydration that they've actually fallen off onto the table. And so this idea of the vanitas was to remind the viewer of their own mortality. It was to be hung on the wall and for them to look at and be reminded that um, they had been blessed uh, with wealth and that um, their life would eventually come to an end. And so they needed to live a life that was pious so that they could go to heaven. Um, these type of still lives 
or something that were a product of the church not allowing art in their um, worship space. The church doesn't allow art in the worship space because they feel that um, their icons are being worshipped instead of being used to focus the um, sinner on praying. The Vanitas uh, is a work of art that has been sort of um, associated with death uh, in the European world f since the 17th century. In addition to, um, I don't think this is a very great example of Vanitas in terms of representing things that the viewer would naturally identify with. Um, you know, the Vanitas had to be personalized for the household that it belonged to. So for all we know, the household that it belonged to owned a pretzel stand. And the reason it resonated with the viewer was because they own the pretzel stand and the pretzels are falling apart and going stale. I don't really know. Um, because we don't know the family that it belonged to. Um, additionally, the Vanitas is one of those little masters um, specialties. So Clara Peters is a Vanitas specialist, um, and that came from having those areas of specialty, uh, or having the Catholic Counter-Reformation and the Protestant Reformation um, in the Dutch world. So in the Dutch world, like I showed you on the map, they're very isolated. So if they don't specialize in something, they worry about going out of business and being unrelevant. They have to find a market. Um, and in this case, Clara Peters has found that these moral inducing still lives are ones that are important um, to a group or subset of people. And because of that, she's able to find a way to sell her art. Uh, so keep that in mind as you learn more and more about the Vanitas um, in the next few slides. Okay, so this is a much better example of a Vanitas. So what would happen is often artists would specialize in Vanitas painting. So somebody who maybe had painted still lives for the Catholic Church now is are painting still lives. Um, underneath the Reformation, and they're painting these specialized still lifes called Vanitas. Vanitas is a still life that is meant to remind the viewer of their own immortality. Um, it's meant to remind the viewer that eventually life will end, and so it's to be hung in the home uh, to influence the viewer to be a moral upstanding citizen on good behavior. Oftentimes the Vanitas will reflect the education of the person that's commissioned it. In this case, he, the person we know reads and writes because there's a sharpened quill that's been dipped in ink sitting in the front and it's in a prominent place, as well as um, there's a book and a manuscript underneath the skull. Obviously the skull is the symbolism for death, um, you can see the absence of the candle is also a symbol of mortality. Um, there's a wine glass that has fallen forward to us, and it has a reflection of the window in the wine glass. And this is a symbol that states that there is life after death because you can see that the window is reflected in the wine glass, and it's falling towards us. Um, these... Anatases had impeccable realism to them. And they're just wonderful pieces of art. There are many Dutch artists that specialize specifically in Vanitas. And if you're interested in Vanitas and you haven't turned in a paper proposal, I would suggest that you consider doing Vanitas because Vanitas um, are very interesting to look at. So this particular still life still displays wealth and abundance. Um, you can see the orb that uh, reflects the room in it. 
um, wants, uh, I hope you recognize that as being a trademark of the Dutch area. It is one that Van Eyck pioneered um, when he reflected the entire room in the clock of the Arnolfini wedding portrait. You see a compass that sits at the front of the desk. Um, the compass represents travel and um, time. The violin uh, is something that represents um, travel and wealth, the appreciation for music. We see um, great detail paid to the surfaces of the objects. So the orb, um, the violin, you can even see the wood grain in the sides of a violin. Um, you can see the glass that is um, toppled over towards the viewer. Um, things are set at an angle because they've figured out that putting things at an angle helps to uh, relate with the viewer more readily. You see the skull behind the violin. That skull is there to remind the viewer of their own mortality. And the skull is a representation of the memento more. Um, if you remember right, the memento more was just an object uh, within the painting that reminds the viewer of their own mortality. Um, the reference of passage of time in this one isn't quite as apparent as it was in the very first vanitas that we looked at. So there's not a big bouquet of flowers that's wilting and getting ready to die. Um, the message of time is sort of imbued in the objects. So you've got this compass, you've got the violin um, that takes time to play, time begins and ends with music. Um, It also warns the viewer against materialism. You do see a sense of um, the paper sort of rotting a bit below the violin, uh, but for the most part, the things that are present are things that are material. Um, it warns against being so obsessed with things that um, you get wrapped up in the worldly goods instead of the afterlife. Vanitas is a word that actually literally means empty. Um, and so it warns against the emptiness of objects and things in life. So um, flowers are an object that appear quite frequently in Vanitas paintings. Um, particularly because they uh, have a short lifespan, right? Once you pick them, they eventually wilt and die. Um, floral paintings were a distinct genre um, in the Dutch Republic. And that has to do with the fact that if you've ever been to the Dutch world, you know that this is an area that flowers are cultivated um, on farms. Uh, one of the highlights of going to Holland would be to see the fields of Dutch tulips. Um, Rochelle Roish was one of the main uh, painters that painted or specialized in vanitases of flowers. Roish's father was a professor of botany and anatomy um, which might have accounted for her interest in the knowledge of plants and insects. Um, she acquires an international reputation for lush paintings um, of flowers in the still life nature. In this image, we see the lavish floral bouquet um, wilting and spilling out over top of the vase. Um, which means that it had lots of excess. The person that was able to keep them had excessive amounts of money to spend on lots of flowers. Um, that's true in our culture as well. Uh, people who have more conservative looking flowers tend to be people who aren't willing to spend money on a professional florist to decorate their homes. Um, 
people with lots of money spend money on professional florists to come in and decorate their homes. And so um, we see that there's a sense of wealth being portrayed here through the floral flowers. Um, Reusch becomes famous for her floral paintings and still lives from about 1708 to about 1716. And she serves as the court painter for the Elector Palatine. Um, he is the ruler of Palatine to the former division of Bavaria in Dusseldorf, Germany. Um, Rochelle Reusch has many of these beautiful still lives. Uh, they're, they're floral paintings that uh, sort of look like a funeral arrangement. Uh, like they remind me of uh, arrangements that maybe you would take home after a funeral and then they would begin to wilt um, and die and so the arrangement is doing that it's wilting and dying. Um, Rochelle Roche is famous for these paintings in fact if you go to any modern art museum today you'll likely run into one of these paintings that Rochelle Roche did um, flowers that uh, she typically names them flowers still life um, somewhere in between the uh, late 1600s and early 1700s. 